Welcome to this edition of Colors of Life. Today we'll be talking about revival. We'll take a forensic look at the Nigerian church, its strengths and its weaknesses, and what revival looks like. To join me to discuss this important topic is Dr. Gary Maxi. Dr. Gary was originally born in America, but he's now Nigerian. He's the founder of the West African Theological Seminary and the pastor of New Beginnings Church in Lagos. Dr. Maxi, welcome to our show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I must add, Dr. Maxi is an author. He's written four books, is it? Uh, 16, to be honest. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but today I have one in my hand. I've read two of his books. Um, but I'd like to be discussing the seduction of the Nigerian church, which he co-authored with Dr. Peter Ozodo. So Dr. Maxi, tell us a bit about your background. I, of course, am a missionary. I came to Nigeria in 1982. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. My father, my grandfather were pastors and also Bible college teachers and administrators. Uh, my wife and I uh, had a missionary call early on. We spent our first 10 years uh, of missionary service in Latin America, uh, Mexico, and then uh, a lot of uh, evangelism in Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Uh, but. You know, surprise, surprise, God called us to Africa. And uh, we came, as I said, in 1982. And to Nigeria specifically? To Nigeria. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So can you briefly tell us about the revivals that you cover in your book, Capturing a Lost um, Vision? I wrote the book, Capturing a Lost Vision. The subtitle is, Can Nigeria's Greatest Revival Live Again? Uh, to talk about the Civil War revival, uh, the revival that took place in this country between the mid-60s and the mid-70s. Uh, I was intrigued by that. When I came to the country in the early 80s, I could, I could still see the after effects of that revival. And so uh, I, I felt that there was a need to examine that and then raise that question. Is it possible to see revival come again to this country. Uh, it wasn't truly a national revival, but it was the closest thing to that that we've ever seen here in Nigeria. Uh, and we so, had, from that movement, tell us about like the scripture union that swept the campuses. You covered that Capro, um, the Calvary Ministries. Well, exactly. The Civil War revival had origins both in the West, especially in the universities, University of Ibadan, and University of Ife, uh, and then in the East, particularly from the Scripture Union. Of course, Scripture Union was not active in the universities in the West, but many of the students had come up through the Scripture Union. And then in the East, of course, especially during the Civil War from uh, 1967 to 70, uh, the Scripture Union was very active. Uh, Bill Roberts, who had come from UK as uh, their field secretary, was particularly uh, active. And so Scripture Union played a great role. And then with the National Youth Service, of course, the um, converts through the Scripture Union in universities were dispersed around Nigeria and were able to take that revival. To well, exactly, and, and that's what led to the establishment of Capro, for example, okay. uh, in the early 70s. Tell when, us what Capro is about. Well, Calvary Ministries uh, was launched, again, the, uh, in uh, the early 70s, uh, Yakubu Gowan announced the establishment of the uh, National Youth Service Corps, and uh, many people were from the South were skeptical about it, but people like Paul Elton said, hey, this is our opportunity uh, to take the gospel to the North at government expense, so to speak. Yes. And so students who went to places like Zaria, uh, Kaduna State, uh, they eventually established 
Calvary Ministries, which of course today has become the largest non-denominational missionary sending agency on the continent. Very, very significant. It grew out of that revival. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, you've mentioned Pa Elton. We can't talk about the history of the church in Nigeria without mentioning Pa Elton. We'll go back to him. But what does a true revival look like? What are the characteristics of a genuine revival? Revival has definite precedence, it has definite characteristics, it has definite results. Okay. Uh, a revival is a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit on uh, God's people. Okay. So the revi a revival is not for unbelievers. The revival okay. is the bringing back to life of God's people. Okay but it is always preceded by a conviction of want, a conviction for sin, a conviction for backsliding, and by fervent prayer. Those are absolutely necessary precedents to genuine revival. And then it results in true repentance, uh, restitution, uh, and eventually, of course, in the coming to life producing evangelism and missions. Okay. And um, those are the characteristics that you have somewhat um, pointed out are lacking in a way where we are not seeing or we've not seen that sort of revival again. Now, talking about Pat Elton, I'm just going to quote something he wrote to take a um, narrow into the situation of the Nigerian church. Mm -hmm. Um, pa Elton has used, he noted that the map of Africa is shaped like a gun and that Nigeria was in the position of the trigger. So this is what Elton said. And I think this highlights Nigeria's importance in global um, Christian revival. He said there'll be trouble in all the strategic points of the gun because the devil will not want God to use Africa as a weapon to shoot into the camp of the enemy. The Horn of Africa is the leading point. The devil will trouble this region to prevent the gun from being loaded. The outlet of the bullet, South Africa, is bound by apartheid to prevent the bullet from being discharged. But the outlet will be opened. Nigeria occupies the position of the trigger and the devil will do all he can, even if the gun is loaded, to stop the tr trigger from being released. <sighs> hmm. But I've heard someone say that the Nigerian church is very wide but shallow in depth. What would you say to that? Well, there's no question about that in my own mind. And that, that's what led uh, Peter Ozodo and me to write The Seduction of the Nigerian Church. In fact, uh, both of us have had a long-standing burden for revival, but we have come to the conviction that we may never see genuine revival until we first have reformation. And what we mean by that is that a lot of false teachings have come into the church over the last 40 to 50 years. And that's where we talk about the seduction of the church, right? Exactly. So I'm talking to Dr. Gary Maxey about the Nigerian church and revival. We'll take a break now and when we come back we would look at the issues that are plaguing the church and how we can see re revival again. Colors of Life. Welcome back to our Colors of Life show, where we're talking to Dr. Gary Maxey on revival and the Nigerian church. To quote Dr. Maxey, he says concerning Nigeria, Na here I they live, and na here I go die. Dr. Maxey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, we were just um, talking with, during the break and we said, someone had said the Nigerian church is a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think that's part of what you've highlighted in your books and even in the one I'm holding, The Seduction of the Nigerian Church. You have said here that all is not well with the Nigerian church. What do you mean by that? Across the past uh, 40 years or so, uh, a number of false teachings have come into the church that have led to uh, shallowness. Okay. And uh, we, in fact, these are things which, to a large degree, uh, cooled the fires of the Civil War revival. So yes, we're in trouble because of a lot of false teaching that has created shallowness. So could you enumerate some of the most 
heightened ones, for instance? Well, the most, the most commonly known one, the one that people comment a lot about, is the health and wealth gospel or uh, the word of faith movement. It goes by many uh, descriptions, and that is the teaching that came originally from E.W. Kenyon, passed on uh, to Kenneth Hagin, and the creating of that whole theological system, which eventually you know, led to the, the idea that uh, prosperity, material, financial, uh, physical prosperity uh, takes precedence over, uh, over everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was unbalanced, quite unbalanced, and fed into materialism, of course, greed, etc. All, we all see this, and yeah. I think there's a general awareness that there's been an imbalance. And perhaps um, a lot of Christians fall in, into the error of not doing enough physically to, um, you know, like work hard, um, get a good job, be diligent at the job, but rather tending to, you know, confess and expect promotion and, and prosperity and all that. So what else? Um, apart from the health and wealth gospel? Well, there's actually f four things that okay. we highlight in the book. That's one. Mm -hmm. uh, a second one is the infiltration of more African traditional religious mentality, ATR mentality into the church. Uh, and then the third one can, would... Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Some as practical a, examples. So well, we as a matter of fact... Uh, I have written a, another book recently which spells that out in more detail, co-authored with Professor Omar Dan Fulani. The book is called Juju versus Christianity, an African Dilemma. Uh, what we're talking about here is both uh, overt and covert uh, ATR mentality coming in, such as you know, ATR is a focus on the here and now rather than the hereafter. It's very man-centered, anthropocentric, uh, which of course is also true of the prosperity gospel. But uh, you get everything from, uh, uh, well, a common example would be the the cursing of your enemies, okay. uh, which has come almost front and center within the uh, the, some of our churches. Uh, ATR is caught up with the feeling that I'm constantly threatened by mm -hmm. evil forces around me and uh, people are plotting against me. Therefore, uh, I must uh, re return those curses. You know, you see the the bumper sticker that says back to sender. Okay. Uh, you know, people from the West wouldn't understand this, but, but here we understand it because I know that my enemy is uh, cursing me, so I need to bounce it back it to uh, him. To and him. what does Jesus say about Well, the Bible is quite clear on okay. this. The Bible says, love your enemies, do good to those that persecute you. Uh, in fact, uh, the book of Romans says, bless and do not curse. I mean, I don't know how plainer the scripture could be than that. Okay. So what's the third one then? The third one is a change in our understanding of what spirituality is. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, if I said that my brother is a man of God, yeah. uh, we would immediately know a hundred years ago that I mean that he is a very Christ-like person. Okay. He is an ethical, moral, and spiritually minded person. Okay. But in our contemporary situation, uh, it's possible now to be a man of God and still and yet live a life perhaps a secret life, perhaps a life that doesn't appear before the public, which is not like Christ. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, signs and wonders and charismata have taken the place of, of deep ethics. So our okay. very concept of spirituality has changed. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the third very important area. The, the fourth okay. area that we talk about is 
the hyper grace movement. This Before is, we go to the fourth, can right. I just um, talk about a bridge th that I saw in your book between sure. perhaps the second and the third, which is the almost defying of the men of God and almost making them like an intermediary between us and God. Can you talk about that and that coming from our culture? Well, absolutely. In fact, that is also a part of the, uh, the uh, accentuation of African traditional religion in the church. And okay. that is uh, traditionally within African society, a lot of focus is placed on uh, the big man yeah. uh, who is accorded all respect, uh, who is never closely examined uh, because he is almost beyond a criticism. Uh, this type of thing, of course, is carried over into the church and too much focus is placed on one single person who in, in essence almost takes the place of God. Uh, that's certainly possible. Then finally, the hyper-grace message. Yes. Can you tell us about that? The hyper-grace movement ha is, is more recent uh, than, for example, the Word of Faith movement. The Word of Faith movement's been around 40, 50 years. Hyper-grace, maybe for maybe the last 20 years. This is the, the teaching that uh, grace is so all-encompassing that my sins are forgiven past, present, and future, uh, meaning that once I am a recipient of God's grace, I never again have to confess anything, uh, never have to say sorry, uh, so to speak. And what it is is a modern form of what we call antinomianism, and that is you can live any how you like mm. as long as you have the grace of God in your life. Mm -hmm. um, there are other corollaries to the hyper-grace movement. Uh, for example, uh, they denigrate the Old Testament and, and even the teachings of Jesus and mm. focus primarily on uh, the uh, writings of the New Testament after the resurrection. Mm. Uh, I had one leader here in Lagos tell me recently the only part of the Bible I take really seriously is from Romans to Philemon. Uh, anything before that uh, is not for us. Uh, this is obviously false teaching, uh, but, and, but by the way, it has appeal uh, because a lot of people live in a fog of legalism in which they are never quite sure if God is happy with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up with that mentality in, in many respects, and it's a deadly mentality. You're, mm -hmm. It's works righteousness. Uh, hyper grace tries to move people beyond that by saying God is happy with you mm -hmm. all the time. Mm. Uh, he's happy with you no matter what you do. He's, it's a settled issue. And I think we hear that a lot from televangelism coming from the oh, US, of course. I believe. Of course. I mean, the, the primary you know, global prophet, so to speak, uh, is uh, Joseph Prince from Singapore, who, by the way, uh, has some good teachings. Okay. Uh, but mixed in with that is this false gospel of hyper grace. And you also mentioned Joel Austin in your book. That's correct. Is that also part of the uh, Joel Osteen is also of, of a similar bent. Uh, and again, uh, these, it's not that these people are in total error. Okay. Uh, it hardly ever comes that way. I mean, usually there's some truth, okay. uh, but then there's subtle error with it, which of course makes it so important that we are grounded in the Bible. So Dr. Baxi, we'll take a break now, and when we come back, we'll discuss what genuine revival looks like and what the Nigerian church can do to see a genuine revival. Good, thank you, thank you. So do stay with us for the concluding part of our discussion on revival and the Nigerian church. Welcome back to our Colors of Life show, where I'm discussing with Dr. Gary Maxi on revival and the Nigerian church. He's the author of 16 books. One is in my hand, The Seduction of the Nigerian Church. So Dr. Maxi, we've talked about the seduction of the Nigerian church in brief, but now we want to talk about revival. 
you know, which is um, a burden that you and some, you know, some of us carry. And we want to ask, how do we know when a genuine revival comes? I remember reading about the Welsh revival, and I read that as a result of the Welsh, Welsh revival, which took place in the 1800s, um, the, the, the courts didn't have lots of cases. The hospital beds were largely empty. The prisons were not that populated. The pubs shut down. Mm -hmm. Right. Have we seen a genuine revival in Nigeria? Well, we have not. Not, not a national revival. We've yeah. seen revival on a, a local uh, scale here and there. Okay. Uh, the greatest revival on this continent was the East Africa revival, which uh, started in the late 20s and 30s and continued on literally for two, three, four decades. Uh, and, and deeply impacted uh, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, uh, Burundi, Kenya. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that in Nigeria. Uh, but I believe we can and I believe we will. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the very passion of my heart. This is why I'm here. Uh, this is why West Africa Theological Seminary was established, was with a vision for revival. Real revival begins when people begin to pray knowledgeably uh, and begin to humble themselves before God and are gripped with a deep sense of need. It is impossible to have revival uh, until you have a great sense of need. Uh, there's something about many of our churches... And this is not need for personal aggrandizement and prosperity. What sort of need are we talking about? I'm talking about spiritual lack, spiritual okay. want, spiritual destitution. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, when people become gripped with a sense that uh, their lives are not what they should be, that there is backsliddenness, that they have grown cold in their relationship with God, when they become gripped with that and begin to cry out like Isaiah did, woe is me, uh, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. When that captures an entire people, you begin to see genuine revival because then uh, honest confession comes out, uh, honest repentance begins to come about. And That's that what real revival, revival is about. Is. And then when that happens, what happens to the secular society? Well, the impact <laughs> of genuine revival is, is, is transforming to society. Uh, in fact, one of the greatest reasons why we can say revival has not really happened in Nigeria in a broad sense is that our society is so incredibly corrupt. How is it possible in a country that is majority Christian and that has such a high number of people who call themselves Bible-believing Christians that we're also labeled, uh, in some instances, the most corrupt oh, country in the world? It's not possible. Yeah. It yeah, tells you that something is wrong, wrong yeah. inside the church. Yeah. Uh, and genuine revival will change that. So, Dr. Maxi, I was personally really touched by this book, and it caused me to ask myself questions about my work with God. Now, so there may be people out there like me who are thinking, mm, we're not quite where we should be. So what do I do to have a genuine personal revival, which I believe if many of us have, then would translate into a real revival in the church? Well, I think you've asked the right question because revivals always begin with individuals. Uh, it's an in, it, it, it mushrooms from there. Okay. And therefore, it's possible literally for anybody okay. to not only be personally revived, but to become the spark for a broader revival. The Welsh revival that you mentioned uh, was largely sparked by one man, and he was a very humble, uh, uh, almost a layman type of person okay. uh, who got revived. So I, as an individual, I can humble myself before God, acknowledge my spiritual backsliddenness, my spiritual coldness, and come back to God. And if I do that, it will inevitably begin to influence others around me. And as you've said, we must change our Christian focus from myself to being focused on God. Oh, absolutely. You see, the current 
errors that we have in the church very often focus on self-centeredness, on, on, on greed. You know, in fact, it, religion for many Nigerians has come to be more about me, me, okay. me, rather than about God. Uh, it's now no longer thy will be done, but it's my will be done. And we, we must move beyond that. Dr. Maxi, it's been a real enlightening discussion. And I want to thank you for documenting, you know, the history of the Nigerian church in, you know, the way that you have in your various books. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have been with you. Thank you. So we've been talking to Dr. Gary Maxi of the West African Theological Seminary on the Nigerian church and revival. We look forward to having you again next week. Do remember to stay in touch via social media and have a great week.